I'm very pleased to be able to say congratulations to Bill and to yourself, of course, for winning two awards, the Private Bank of the Year and Innovation in Retail Banking in Luxembourg. So many congratulations indeed and your award. Ah, thank you very much. Pleasure. Excellent. Now we're very proud to receive this uh, award and uh, this is the first time. Uh, I hope actually we will have this reward every year going forward and many more to come. So again, thank you very much and uh, we will cherish this for sure. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. So Adrian, um, once again, congratulations on the awards. Thank um, you very much. What are your plans to expand the footprint of services uh, that uh, Bill currently offers? For example, would you like to expand geographically? And if so, how would you set about that? Well, we have actually expanded geographically quite some time ago. As our name says, uh, Bank Anthem is now Luxembourg. We are an international bank. As a matter of fact, the majority of our clients are not Luxembourg-based clients, they're international clients. Mm. We have started to expand. We have uh, uh, locations in, in, in Switzerland, in Denmark, in Belgium, in Singapore, and now in Dubai, where we just opened about two months ago. But we have also decided that we have to focus. So in terms of further expansion, I think we will keep it with that footprint in terms of geographic expansion. Uh, but in terms of uh, services and solutions for clients, of course, we are always looking for innovation and this is a continuous process. And, and that innovation is kind of beyond the day-to-day -day banking business. It's about creating real value for your customers. Uh, correct. It is all about bringing solutions to clients. And we are not a, we are a universal bank, but we are not a huge bank. We are a good-sized bank. We see ourselves more as a boutique. So our strength is really to see what's out there in the market in terms of innovation and bringing through our bank, repackage it and actually bring it to our clients. Now, Luxembourg is, is kind of known as a global hub of private banking and wealth management. But how do you cater for the very diverse demands from across the world? As we become kind of more globalized and interconnected, uh, have you found any kind of convergence of demand from the clients that you work with? You know, it's actually quite interesting. I, originally, I come from Switzerland. I come from Swiss private banking. And it's quite interesting. We used to go out in the world and we used to sell our services and say, you know, you have to bank with Switzerland. It's in the center of Europe. It's not in the center of Europe, I apologize. It is not part of the EU. <clears throat> it is a AAA country, etc. And Luxembourg actually has a lot to offer as financial center. It has an amazing amount of skilled workers in, in some areas, much more than Switzerland to a certain degree. And it is not as well known worldwide with the ultra high net worth segment as for example, Switzerland. But exactly that makes it very interesting. Uh, we opened up an office in Dubai not long ago and people there don't really know where Luxembourg is. But if you explain the fact that it is the gateway to Europe, it's a triple A country, uh, it's the, one of the largest fund administrator in the world, I mean people start listening and it's, it's actually quite interesting how you can sell the location Luxembourg. And apart from the location, what do you think are the products and services that make Bill stand out from its competitors in the private banking wealth management marketplace? How do you set yourself apart from the crowd? Yeah. I think we try to set ourselves apart from the crowd. Uh, one has to see this is not an easy task to do. I mean, you ask every bank and every bank says it has competitive advantages. However, we see ourselves as a boutique, as I mentioned earlier. We are not a product seller towards the clients. We are a solution provider for our clients. We have an array of specialists in terms of tax planning, wealth planning, uh, setting up structures, corporations, etc. This uh, all different type of activities that we can bundle and, may, and basically provide the client with a solution. I think a lot of banks don't do that. A lot of banks are basically selling their products. And we try to listen to the client and come up with a solution that fits him best. Mm. And thinking about that kind of solution-based approach, one of the things I noticed is um, young people get mentioned in terms of, of the people that you are focused on. Uh, give me an example of the kind of solutions that you offer for young people. 
Well, for young people, I think we focus with young people, of course, in our retail network in Luxembourg, mm. less on the private banking side, yeah. obviously. So for the private banking side, I don't think we have a specific offer for young people. <laughs> but, but nonetheless, thinking about the kind of journey from cradle to grave in terms of what you offer people. Ah, okay. I think what we're focusing on is, is we're focusing on the next generation. If you look at the statistics in private banking, and this is worldwide, especially in the, in the offshore private banking, the average age of the client is between probably 65 and, and 85. That, that is a reality. And we, as a bank, we have to focus heavily on trying to capture the next generation or even the generation thereafter. And this is not easy to do to a certain degree because the whole nature of our business has changed over the last years. Ways that we are doing it is, of course, with innovation in IT. We're not the only ones out there. We have all the applets that you need nowadays. Uh, but also, secondly, what's even more important is we have access to direct access to, be it investment advisors, be it to our CIO, etc. So the younger generation who wants to be more involved, they can actually talk to investment professionals, not just relationship managers who in the past went for dining and whining, but really to people who know the markets, who know what's going on out there. So we, we offer this access to those people in a very personalized fashion. And thinking about um, kind of the broader market and banking uh, within Luxembourg itself, how do you expect it to develop over the next few years? I think we will see a consolidation uh, with various banks. You see a lot of larger plays in Luxembourg are potentially divesting certain businesses also in private banking. So I think there will be a consolidation. In terms of financial center, I think Luxembourg will remain to be very strong, especially in the fund administrative side, but also in, on the private banking side. And, and the reason is quite simple. You have a country with roughly not quite 500,000 or 550,000 inhabitants with a high dependency on financial services industry. So that concentration you don't see in other countries. You have a regulator who is very close to the business. You have a government who is very close to the business and very accessible. I was just at the opening of our Dubai branch and the finance minister was there for a press conference. So I think it is the speed of making decisions. It's the access to the regulator. If you launch new products or new solutions and you need to have a regulate, regulatory approval, you can do this in a very fast and efficient way. And I think this is important in today's world with ever-changing regulatory environment. And, and thinking of the, uh, the kind of environment over the last few years, since the, the challenges that we've had, yeah. how has the bank uh, dealt with those in Luxembourg? And how has Luxembourg itself dealt with uh, that kind of development from the very, very difficult times that we had? Well, I think Luxembourg not just Luxembourg, but Luxembourg being one of these traditional offshore banking places, uh, same as Switzerland to a certain degree, Monaco, Gibraltar, and also London to a certain extent. I think over the last years, there has been a shift in terms of, a shift of clients to a certain degree. In the past, there has been, one of the purposes to have money in offshore places was probably to avoid taxation to a certain degree. I think these times are 100% over. It, it doesn't exist anymore. But this caused a big shift in uh, the way a bank has to be operated. In the past, the bank did not have to be too efficient because the margins were very high. And also here, it's not just the regulatory environment that has changed, but it's also the financial markets with record low interest rates. I always talk about the perfect storm that the private banking industry uh, is in. You have record low interest rates, which hurts uh, the profitability. On the other hand, you have a shifting client base. And to make things even worse, you actually have less revenues on the client. So within this process, I think you have to become very efficient and smart. You have to become, you have to outsource certain functions. You have to ensure that your IT systems are very efficient. But at the end of the day, clients still are asking for service and even more service. So you have to add costs 
in terms of foreign tax regulations, uh, tax consulting, and all these, these aspects. They were not necessarily in the past, but nowadays they are necessary. So it is a very difficult time for banks. And uh, I have to say, though, that Bill is faring very well. We managed to, over the last uh, couple of years, to increase our profits uh, nicely. Our uh, business is growing. Uh, we're actually gaining client assets every year. So it's actually a nice picture for us. And in thinking about, you mentioned Dubai uh, and the new office opening there. Are you looking to expand into kind of some more niche areas? So, for example, the whole area of Sharia banking. Uh, is that an opportunity that you're looking at? Well, I mentioned earlier we, we look at our business as a boutique approach, a solution provider. And, and yes, we do. Uh, we're talking to clients in the Middle East and if there's a need for a Sharia compliant investment vehicle, we can provide this and we will provide this. But at the end of the day, it's all a matter of scalability. You have to specialize, focus, but if you want to be a solution provider, you just have to make sure that you get the right components. You don't want to manufacture every little widget for your products. So here it's again finding the right balance. And uh, we just formed uh, a couple of months ago a new unit called product management. It's within a new division that is called product and services that, we, that I established about uh, a year ago. And now within this, we have a product management unit with the specific task to provide solutions, bundle solutions for clients. Now listen to clients, listen to client advisors, listen to our financial specialists, looking out in the market and also looking at market trends and come up with ideas and solutions. And it could be a Sharia compliant product or whatever is out there that but, makes sense. But again, that, the challenge, isn't it, between the kind of, if you like, the uh, electronic technical solutions and the face-to-face, -face, the advice uh, packaging things up, customizing things. Yeah. How will this affect private banking, that balance between those two uh, in particular? You know, there are a lot of books written about this. And I think you have in, in, pri in let's start with retail. I think the retail is all about digital revolution. In my opinion, in the future, you will not go to a retla retail outlet. You will do it all online. With private banking, I have a different opinion. I use myself as an example. I used to have a trading account with one of the large online traders. I thought to myself, I don't need any help. It's, everything is in there. You go on, you have nice research, you have everything. But there is still the human behavior side to it. And the average person is not a good investor and is not self-driven. He may need access in terms of to its accounts to do payments, but get financial advice by the internet. I think we still have a long way to go. I think people need and people want the human interaction. If they buy into a stock and the stock is not moving in their direction, if they just look at the computer screen, they may be triggered to push the button and sell it at the wrong time. But if they can talk to somebody, get advice, potentially get comfort or get rationale behind it, I think this is a service that will continue to be very important in our industry. In terms of wealth management, the other big issue facing the whole sector is regulation. Yeah. Uh, any views on where you see the regulatory uh, spotlight falling over the next year or so? Well, I hope it's not going to increase even more. Uh, I think over the last years, uh, maybe also due to Lehman collapse made off, I think the regulators uh, uh, start uh, bringing out uh, you know, new regulations on, on, a, on a regular basis. At the end of the day, these regulations hurt the clients. They don't necessarily hurt the bank. For us, it's a matter of implementation. It's a matter of IT. It's costly. But at the end of the day, I believe that the client is hurt because it limits the choices a client has. And the client is more and more burdened with administration. We are obliged to ask him much more background information on his financial needs, etc. Some clients don't like this. So I believe that we have maybe not reached the pinnacle, but there has to be a little bit of a liberalization going forward in terms of regulations. And Europe, of course, uh, sits at the heart of a lot of that regulation. Um, and we're still recovering from yeah. the kind of worldwide financial crisis. Um, what's Bill's view about the economic outlook for 2015 uh, particularly uh, in terms of investments that might do well? Well, I'm not the CIO of Bill, <coughs> unfortunately. 
But I think if I look at the, the current situation, uh, with es especially potentially running in a defl deflationary environment with uh, ever record low interest rates, amazingly the United States seems to be on, on a path of recovery, which is quite interesting. I'm not too optimistic for Europe uh, in 2015. Uh, I think it goes through vast structural changes. The quantitative easing that is ongoing as we talk potentially will put even more pressure on the euro. So I don't have a crystal ball in front of me, uh, but I would say that uh, it will not be the easiest year. Um, you're you're uh, in banking. Yeah. How did your career actually begin in, in banking in the first place? Well, actually, I didn't start my career in banking, as a matter of fact. I, I started my career with the largest food company in the world, with Nestle, in, uh, in marketing in, in, in Japan. But I draw a lot of similarities and, uh, to private banking to a certain degree. I mean, this may sound totally ludicrous now, but I always tell people, if you know how to sell a Chinese housewife a coffee, you can actually promote financial solutions to ultra high net worth individuals. At the end of the day, it's the same process. So I learned a lot about marketing, product management, how to create a need for something, how to advertise it to a certain degree, and especially how to be efficient. Now, if you look at these large consumer good companies, they are absolutely amazingly efficient. They have to be, because they, are, they have paper margins. If you look at pa banks in the past, there's no, if, there's no industrialization, there is no efficiency, because they never had to be. But right now, we're in a period of change, and the banks have to become more efficient. So I can draw actually a lot of on that experience in my earlier days. And, and do you think that experience has helped you particularly on the client focus that you bring to your current role? Probably less on the, on the client focus. After my consumer good uh, experience, uh, I, I went to business school and, and worked in uh, private equity and, and corporate finance, investment banking in New York and, and partially in Switzerland. And I think that helped me a lot. I gained a lot of know-how, especially now if I talk to clients, if I talk to ultra high net worth, if I talk to family offices or, or family owned companies, I know how to speak their language. I know what their problems are. I can talk about other things than just the stock market and the bond market. I can talk about corporate finance transactions, potential needs, and I think that helped me quite a bit. In addition, I, I've lived in, in several continents, and uh, I think it's always our clients are not Luxembourg clients. They come from pretty much every country of the world. So also this experience, having lived and worked uh, outside Europe uh, significant years, actually helps me quite a bit in dealing with clients. And with that kind of experience and that background and insight as well, what were the major challenges that you found when you arrived at the bank itself? Well, the major challenges to a certain degree, uh, a challenge is a strong word, I guess. The interesting thing is, if you look at Bill, a very large part of our bank is private banking. A very large part of our clients are non-Luxembourg clients. They're international clients. But the bank thought of itself as a Luxembourg, pure Luxembourg bank. So the biggest challenge but, uh, is really to bring in a little bit more the international side to the business. And, and this is quite interesting to see now. We, I, hired, uh, I, I changed the entire organization over the last year and a half. A, a new organization hired a lot of new people, of course, uh, promoted also some, uh, some people who have been with the company for a long time. So for the first time we really have a mix of new people. And it's, it's interesting to see the new dynamic, the way we discuss, the, the way we approach issues. And I think bringing in new people, but also empowering people who have been with the bank for a long time, having that healthy mix is the biggest challenge. And thinking about bringing in new people then, what are the values you're looking for when you're trying to get people to support yeah. change and innovation and development? What are the values you, you seek out? I think what's important for me is, I always tell my people, we don't have to become friends at work. I respect everyone's private life. But there are a couple of principles that I would like people to follow. I would like people to take responsibility. I want people to take, to make decisions. I want people to be accountable for their decisions. I want people to make mistakes, just not big mistakes, but make mistakes and learn from mistakes. 
And I want transparency. I think these are all the little buzzword that uh, I'm repeating on a constant basis. You need to have an environment where people can openly talk. You need an environment where people can make mistakes and learn from mistakes. I want people to make decisions, which I, I, I tell you is not always that easy because a lot of people are afraid of making decisions because it may be the wrong position, uh, the wrong uh, decision. So this is really a cultural change and I think this is the biggest challenge for sure. And it, in conclusion, what new private banking and wealth management services will you offer clients and customers over the next year? I think there's a lot of innovation out there. I don't have a specific example, uh, but uh, as I mentioned, we, we're, we're setting uh, up this uh, product management group and I uh, uh, you know, talked to the guy who's running uh, the product and services unit. It's a, uh, and I, I told him, I think we really should be innovative. We should come up with ideas. I want to have ideas. I want to have solutions for clients that nobody knows about. Not, I don't want to be on the bleeding edge of technology, but on the leading edge. And I think it's quite exciting. This little bank in Luxembourg, in the center of Europe, carrying an international name, having some locations outside, but if we manage to bring intelligence into the game and provide solutions that are innovative, of course, generate performance. I mean, without performance, uh, uh, I don't think clients are happy. I think you will hopefully hear quite a bit about that in the future because that's where we invest in quite heavily. Well, we look forward to watching that story evolve uh, over the next year or so. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.